first, Jeff, what's the temperature in Ann Arbor? It's about 14 below zero, 20 mile an hour winds, and that goes for a wind chill about 40 below zero. How unusual is that? <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. The last time we saw conditions this cold was back in 1994. So tell us what an Arctic vortex is. Sure. It's a situation you see every winter over the Arctic. I mean, you've got 24-hour darkness up there, and the cold air tends to build and build and build because of the lack of sunlight. And when you get all that cold air up there, it tends to drive stronger winds. And those winds blow counterclockwise around the pole in a vortex, and those winds tend to isolate that cold air from the rest of the world. And so that cold air can stay cold. And when that happens to slosh over where we are, boy, we sure notice it. Here in New York, we're not only talking about record cold, but yesterday it was more than 50 degrees warmer. It dropped 50 degrees in a matter of hours. How unusual is this? Yeah, that's pretty rare to go a 50 degree change in one day. I mean, back on Sunday, you had, you know, airplanes sliding off runways and then it was 55 on Monday. And now you're down at four degrees, which is like you said, is a record low. Uh, that's some serious weather whiplash. You don't see the things oscillate that extremely very often. Um, Rush Limbaugh, the conservative talk show host, bashed the media for its coverage of the polar vortex, saying reporters are using the recent cold snap to push their global warming, quote, agenda. This is what he had to say. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are having a record-breaking cold snap in many parts of the country. And right on schedule, right on schedule, the media have to come up with a way to make it sound like it's completely unprecedented because they've got to find a way to attach this to the global warming agenda and they have it's called the polar vortex the dreaded polar vortex do you know what the polar vortex is have you ever heard of it well they just created it for this week uh and it's of course you can't Actually, there is a piece. I've got a piece in the stack that actually makes the case that all of this frigid, chilling cold is due to global warming. Strange as it may sound, it says. Other wackos are saying it's a great example of climate change. But regardless, the agenda is that we're responsible. We're causing it. We have to pay the price. That was Rush Limbaugh. Jeff Masters, your response. Yeah, that's good for entertainment, but you don't go to Rush Limbaugh for science. I mean, the polar vortex has been around forever. It's just the media happened to latch onto it this week. I don't know why, but it sure did kind of snowball. It's been around, you know, I've been talking about the polar vortex for years. It's just funny that it got out in the media the way it did this week. Well, but talk about this, because all over Fox and other places, you have this mocking and the derision. See, global warming can't possibly be related to what's happening. So explain how it can. How can the Earth getting hotter relate to such cold weather? Yeah, this is a one in 20 year type of cold weather event, which you expect to see grow less common as the planet heats up. I mean, the planet's heated up about a degree and a half Fahrenheit over the last you know, 130 years. And you expect these one in 20 year events to maybe occur one in 30 years, but they're still going to happen. OK, now counterbalancing the fact that we would expect to see these events grow less common due to the fact the planet's warming up is, well, maybe if we alter circulation patterns, in such a way where the polar vortex now will slip southwards more often, then you could counterbalance that. And there is some evidence over the last few years that the jet stream has been doing something we haven't seen before, or at least not as often. Normally, those winds blow straight west to east with a little bit of waviness to it. But now we're seeing more extreme excursions in the jet stream, where you get these big bulges, these high pressure ridges on one side, and then low pressure dipping far to the south. Very unusual to see these sort of contortions like we've had in recent years. And there is evidence that possibly Arctic sea ice loss could cause that sort of jet stream behavior. Can you talk about what the drunk jet stream is? Yeah. Well, normally the jet blows, like I said, straight west to east. 
But when the winds slow down in the jet stream, now they tend to wander around a little more. They're not constrained to flow in this kind of tight, narrow ribbon so much. Now they can do kind of these big meandering loops. And when you reduce the temperature difference between the equator and the poles, you tend to slow down the winds of the jet stream and you tend to allow this sort of meandering behavior. And this difference in temperature between the equators and the poles has been growing less and less in recent years because we've been losing so much Arctic sea ice. That allows the sun to shine more intensely up there because now you're exposing open water, which is dark, absorbs more sunlight, heats up the area, melts more ice in kind of a vicious cycle, and increases the warmth even more. So all this kind of makes sense that it could be the fact that warming in the Arctic is altering jet stream behavior. Mm. We hear uh, descriptions of how uh, what happens to skin when it's exposed to such cold. Jeff, can you talk more about that? Yeah, where I am in Detroit here, 40 below zero wind chill, if you expose your skin to that kind of extreme low temperature, you're asking for frostbite in just a minute or two. You really shouldn't go out and expose your flesh to that kind of extreme condition. Can you overall give us a roundup of extreme weather in 2013? 2013, if you talk globally, we had $40 billion weather disasters, which ties the record for the most we've ever seen. Now, the actual dollar losses from those events was oh, near average. We didn't have a single, like, Hurricane Sandy or a single drought of 2012, which was a tens of billions of dollars type of loss event. But that kind of a $40 billion sort of year for um, the, these events does make me say, wow, you know, that was a pretty extreme year, even though we didn't have a major La Nina event or an El Nino event, which tends to drive uh, sort of an increase in extreme weather events. So you know, it's hard to quantify extreme weather. We don't have very good ways to do it. We don't have data that goes back in time long enough. But certainly by that measure, by the number of billion dollar disasters, it was a very extreme year.